Thank you very much. I'm delighted to welcome our guest speaker for this morning's session. And our first guest speaker is Professor Stephen Kievel from King's College, who is going to talk about physics and medicine from antiquity to medieval period. So please, a well welcome to Professor Stephen. Well, thank you uh, very much for the kind introduction. And uh, it was an honor to have been uh, invited to come and speak here, particularly to give the, the first talk of the day. It's been very interesting to, to, to think what approach to take to this topic, um, uh, physics and medicine from antiquity to the medieval period. Um, so I, I, I've, I've come at this, therefore, very much as, as a medical physicist. That, that's my background. That's what I understand. So I've sort of tried to think backwards through time with that outlook. And um, so I, I think if most people, if you ask them when medical physics began, they would probably say something about the discoveries about radiation and radioactivity that took place at the end of the 19th century, particularly Röntgen's discovery of, of X-rays and subsequent work by uh, people like Becquerel and, and the Curies. Um, if you take a slightly uh, longer view uh, than that, you might cast your mind back to the sometimes known as the scientific revolution in the 16th and 17th centuries when it was recognized that nature follows uh, physical laws in an orderly way and therefore you could to some extent describe systems including living systems in mechanistic terms. Um, in the work of people like uh, Vesalius and, and Borelli shown on that slide. And uh, also we started to see the development of medical technology based on physics principles like um, uh, clinical thermometers and microscopes, which we'll be hearing a lot more about, I'm sure, later on in the morning. Um, so that, that period, which we might conveniently bookend with um, the public, two key publications, um, Copernicus's De Revolutionibus at the beginning and then Newton's Principia at the end. So lots of developments in, in physics, but also in medical applications thereof. Um, but what I'm going to try and do in this talk is, is to make a case that actually the relationship between physics and medicine is much older than that and indeed goes all the way back to uh, classical antiquity and beyond. Uh, and I'm broadly going to take two approaches to that. First of all, I'm going to think about what we mean when we talk about physics in that very, very early period. Clearly not quite the same as we would mean if we talk about it now. So if you like, coming at it almost from a philosophical approach. And then I'm going to talk about some slightly more concrete things, applications of what we might now think of as physics in, uh, in, in medicine and in clinical practice, again, in that very early period. So if we start off um, thinking about actually what does, what does physics mean, the sort of etymology of the word itself. And of course it's a, it's, it's a Greek uh, word, physici, uh, originally, which, which we might translate as natural science or as, as natural philosophy, both terms that are still in use today in English, uh, and then via Latin, uh, physica, study of nature. Um, but that term, certainly in the Greek context, had a much wider remit than we would imply by the term physics now. It encompassed a lot of what we'd now think of as biology, chemistry, philosophy, maths, um, and perhaps started in the, in the 6th century uh, BCE um, uh, with the uh, pre-Socratic pre philosophers, people like Thales, uh, Empedocles, and Democritus, who were really, among other things, trying to understand the nature of the universe. What is the universe made of, and how does it work? Very much questions that are still in the purview of physics as we think of it now. And uh, Thales uh, was, uh, was known as a monist. He, he thought that everything in the universe was basically made of one substance, which for him was, was water. Uh, Empedocles was a pluralist. He, he originated the what we now think was that the sort of four classical elements, earth, air, fire, and water, and the universe being made of a combination of, of those. And then Democritus, of course, the early uh, atomists who thought the universe was made of small indivisible particles, which bears some resemblance to uh, atoms as we think of them now. Um, 
so very much um, trying to think about how the universe works and what it's, what it's made of. But we often think of Greek uh, <coughs> physics through the lens of Aristotle's uh, physics, um, which really was a collection of, of lectures on, on nature. Um, in the physics, Aristotle talks about the terrestrial spheres, the, the earth and things on it, being made of the four elements of Empedocles, but then a fifth element, uh, ether or quintessence, again, terms that, that sort of resonate in, in modern physics or uh, modern-ish physics as well, uh, which comprise the, the celestial spheres. Um, key themes of Aristotle's work were uh, ideas of change and how change brings about and of, of cause, what, what causes a thing to be. And he, he defined four types of cause, material, what a thing is made of, um, uh, formal, what, what the thing actually is, efficient, how it came to be, and final, what, what, the, what the thing is for. And, and he also applied that idea of final cause to, to biology and said to understand the components of the body, we need to understand their purpose, uh, their telos, why they, why they are. Um, and, and so from that comes this idea of uh, form follows function in biology, although I think that term and its modern use originated in, in architecture. Um, at the end of the classical period, Aristotle's work was uh, preserved in Arabic translation, and uh, Islamic uh, writers such as uh, Avicenna and Al Hazen, who we will hear something about later on, were able to, uh, to, to develop that further, and then it's reintroduced into Western Europe a bit later on, and remained the mainstay of European science right through to the scientific revolution, with people like Copernicus and Newton and Galileo starting to challenge some of those ideas. So interestingly, while we may dismiss um, Aristotle's physics as, as just plain wrong, uh, the, the um, uh, theoretical physicist Carlo Rovelli has, has written uh, references there quite convincingly that actually uh, Aristotelian physics is a good approximation to Newtonian physics in the domain in which it's intended to be valid. In other words, not in, a, in an ideal situation, but in a uh, for, for objects that are sitting in a spherically symmetric gravitational field and in a fluid, in, in other words, on, on Earth, in, in Earth's atmosphere. But that takes us slightly off topic. Um, so where does it, how does this all lead into medicine? That's what I'm supposed to be talking about, physics applied to medicine. Well, um, there are some very, very early texts that have medical components to them, em empirical medicine, but often blended with uh, magical and religious ideas found in uh, Babylonian uh, sources, the, the Code of Hammurabi, and in two very early uh, Egyptian papyri, the Edwin Smith and Eber's uh, papyri, which I'll say a bit more about later. But Greek medicine then looks a, bit, a little bit different from that and developed, as again, as part of the wider natural philosophy. And the Greek philosophers were really trying to find natural rather than supernatural explanations for things, and that included medicine as well as the broader term uh, physics. So it, uh, if you like, Greek medicine developed as a, as a component of that wider natural philosophy. Uh, and in keeping with that, they saw the functioning of the body as, as a microcosm uh, working on the same principles of the rest of the universe, which seems perfectly obvious to us, but was, was novel at the time. Uh, so that you could understand health <coughs> and disease through reason. Being embedded in, in, in philosophy, there was room for debate and for difference of opinion, uh, which was quite different to the more uh, to, to, to the ideas that were present in those earlier Babylonian and Egyptian sources. One limitation was that um, beliefs about the dignity of the body prevented human dissection, and, and so empirical studies were limited, and that prohibition continued through uh, Christian and Islamic civilizations uh, for quite a long time. Um, but seeing uh, medicine as, as, as part of, and seeing the body as part of a wider whole, as a microcosm of a broader sort of physics-based universe, uh, I think was, it was a key idea. And, and I would argue means that in this early period, medicine really was very much dependent on physics as it was understood at the time. So that, that's, that's a key part of the thesis I'm putting forward this morning, really. Um, so two key people to, to mention here. Uh, Hippocrates, often known as the father of medicine, um, who wrote, uh, well, by, by 250 BCE, so not all of his work, but by his, his followers as well, 
uh, the Hippocratic corpus of around 70 works had been assembled. The, the, the mosaic at the top of the slide there shows Hippocrates on the left, and then just arriving in a boat is Asclepius, the, uh, the Greek god of medicine who was, uh, legend has it, was um, uh, Hippocrates' 13 times great-grandfather. Um, and at the bottom you've got Galen, uh, a slightly later physician, but who developed Hippocrates' ideas. Uh, he was a physician to four Roman emperors. He wrote more than any other author in antiquity. A lot of his work was lost in a fire uh, at some point, and yet still we have more writings by Galen than by anybody else. Nearly half of all ancient Greek writings are works by, uh, by Galen. He, he's supposed to have written about 500 different treatises and at one point had perhaps 20 scribes working for him uh, writing those, uh, those works. And again, these ideas were further developed in the Islamic world, uh, as we will see a bit later on. Um, so uh, uh, the key element of Hippocratic medicine uh, was based on the four humours, which are shown on the diagram here around the, the outside. Uh, literally uh, kumos in, 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 in Greek, or uh, meaning juice or, or sap that were believed to be in the body. And they were intrinsically related to the four classical elements. So again here, the whole basis of Greek medicine, which, which persisted through Galen right down into the, into the, um, uh, seven, into the 16th century, um, was based on physics as it was understood at the time. So medicine, as understood then, was based uh, fundamentally on, on physics as understood then. Um, so it was believed that disease was caused by imbalance in the amounts of these different uh, humours. So, for example, um, malaria uh, would be caused by an increase in yellow bile, and therefore that's linked, as you can see at the top, to the element of fire, so heat, malaria is, is causes a fever, and it was more likely to occur in the summer, which is associated with dryness and, and hot weather. So there's a sort of consistency here. Galen's work was unchallenged and considered unchallengeable right down to the 16th century. It was almost heresy to challenge Galen to the extent that when finally uh, anatomical dissection of <coughs> human bodies became possible uh, and Vesalius uh, started to question Galen's descriptions of human anatomy, um, people seriously suggested, well, uh, Galen can't possibly have been wrong. It must be that human anatomy has changed over the centuries, maybe because we wear tighter trousers these days, so it's changed the anatomy of the human hip. So it, it's not quite clear to me, as others may, may know, why it was that Galen was considered quite so unquestionable, but he certainly, certainly was. Right, so, so my, my thesis here then, sort of to come to the end of the first part of this, is that the system of medicine as it was understood, as it was practiced at the time, and indeed right down to the 16th century, was based on, was derived from the contemporary understanding of physics. Therefore, the relationship between physics and medicine in antiquity and the Middle Ages was absolutely fundamental. One followed from the other. But let's think in slightly more practical terms. What, what, in what ways was physics, as we perhaps now understand it, applied to medical practice in that period? And to do that, again, I, I, I think as a medical physicist, I think about how is physics applied to medicine now, and can we apply those concepts retrospectively to earlier periods? Um, and, and I sort of break those down into three categories, if you like. We have the use of uh, physics or physical principles for the purposes of diagnosis, where I take diagnosis to include localising disease and planning treatment. Uh, so here is a modern MRI scanner. You don't expect to see that in a lecture about medicine and physics in antiquity, but there we are. Um, so that's a modern example of using physics in diagnosis. I, I dare say we'll see some more of those uh, later on in the morning, as in the afternoon as well. Then we have using physical agents, by which I mean primarily ionizing radiation, but also heat, light, etc., for the purposes of therapy. And here's a uh, radiotherapy treatment plan from my uh, department at, at, at Guy's, illustrating again the modern interpretation of that. And then what about using physics uh, to, uh, to explain the way the body functions, if you like to, in my view, a lot of physiology is basically applied physics. I, I know that doesn't exhaust all of physiology, but a lot of it works like that. So using 
uh, physics to explain body functions. In this case, a, a PhD student that I had some years ago looking at locomotion using physics and engineering principles. Can we apply those same ideas? What happens if we, what do we discover if we try to apply those same categories retrospectively to antiquity and to the Middle Ages? So let's work through them and start with diagnosis. So here I'm going to talk about Hippocrates again. This is not the first and neither is it the last time you will hear uh, the name Hippocrates during this, this talk. And here we have a, a picture of him uh, as well. Um, so Hippocrates gave the first uh, description of the measurement of body temperature. He was measuring relative temperature rather than absolute, but, but nevertheless. And actually what he was doing, arguably, was mapping out differences in temperature across the surface of the body. Um, and therefore, and, and it gets slightly more tenuous here, you may think, but arguably he was describing the first example of, uh, of medical imaging. Uh, and here I'm drawing particularly on the, the bottom paper there by uh, Otsuka and Togawa over the course of the next few um, slides. So what was the context of this? What was he doing? Well, this was in the context of uh, pleural effusion, so a build-up of fluid between two membranes that surround the lungs. Um, that's a condition that we still see today, and it's treated today as then, as, as in antiquity, by draining the fluid. These days, we uh, commonly use ultrasound guidance, use imaging, to, uh, to, to place a tube to drain the fluid. But of course, that, that technique was not available to Hippocrates. So, so what did he do? Well, in his, in his writings, he talks about uh, listening to the patient's chest. It would have been with the ear, though the stethoscope comes much, much later, while shaking the patient. And presumably, the idea is you, you hear the, the, the fluid, the pus sort of sloshing about, and you know that's where I need to stick my knife and drain off the fluid. But sometimes the build-up of pus in there was so thick that it didn't slosh around. You didn't hear a sound. So then what do you do? How do you know where to, put the, where to stick the knife? And he came up with an absolutely um, uh, very clever approach to that. And he said, well, take a piece of linen and soak it in um, uh, some, some moist uh, Eretrian earth, which is a type of clay which was already in use in medicine for other purposes. So, so uh, medics would have had it on hand. So um, moisten up some of that clay, fine, finely ground, and spread it on a piece of linen and wrap that linen around the thorax of the patient uh, who you are examining. And then you just wait and the clay dries over time. And of course it dries first in the area that's warmest. And th that warm area, that indicates where the, the pleural effusion is underneath. And so you see where it dries first, and that's where you stick the knife and out comes the, the fluid. And you, you could do away with the linen, actually, and just put the clay directly on the patient. But then you have to make sure that several people apply the clay simultaneously, otherwise it dries faster in some areas than others. So he's aware of the possibility of uh, uh, factors that are confounding the experiment and how you, how you deal with those. So a, a sort of physics-based approach, I would suggest. Um, so um, Otsuka and Togawa actually reproduced this method. They, uh, they didn't have a patient with pleural effusion, so they put some red pepper extract on the skin to create a warm area. And here is the skin surface. The, the figures run from sort of down one column and then down the next column. And you can see over time that gray patch, that's the dry clay. So the clay dries first where they put the pepper extract, and then gradually the dry area spreads over the skin. And, um, Otsuka and Tagawa, they said, well, well Hippocrates might have, um, uh, at least he would have formed a sort of visual image of how this drying happened over the surface, and maybe he even sketched it out. And if he did that, he might have got something that looks like this false colour image on the left that they, that they created, showing where the, the pattern of drying of that clay on the surface of the skin. And they compared that Hippocratic thermogram with modern thermograms, thermal images of the surface of the skin in that, in that subject. Uh, and the first one there is before they applied the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the clay and the right-hand side nine minutes later. And again, you see that very hot spot um, mirroring the hot spot or the, the area that dries first in the Hippocratic thermogram on the left. There were some differences between their images and uh, the, the uh, Hippocratic version. They said, well, that um, is because we're not as good at applying the clay evenly as Hippocrates might have been. And also the red pepper extract doesn't just warm up the surface of the skin. It affects 
microcirculation, and that uh, confounds things a little bit and increases the thermal contrast. Um, okay, so an example of using physics principles for, for diagnosis, uh, I would suggest. Let's move on to therapy. So, so we come back here again to the ubiquitous uh, Hippocrates, and one of Hippocrates' most famous works is, is his aphorisms, which is a collection of sort of 87 sayings about uh, medicine. And the very last of those, aphorism 87, is the one that's shown on the, on the slide here. And that translates as, well, I've got the translation on the slide. Those diseases that medicines do not cure are cured by the knife. Those that the knife doesn't cure are cured by fire. Those that fire doesn't cure must be considered incurable. And I've highlighted on the top there those, those three words. Um, uh, pharmaca, which is the, 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 the medicine approach, as in pharmaceuticals. Uh, sideros, which literally is iron, but translated here as, as knife, the surgical instrument. And pur, which is fire. Um, so it just struck me, again, looking at this from a sort of modern medicine and medical physics uh, standpoint, that this mirrors treatment options that we have today, for example, in cancer, where we either have systemic treatments like, like chemotherapy and other drug-based treatments, we have surgery, the, the knife, and we have a little bit of artistic license here, we have radiotherapy, which I'm equating with, with fire, and that, indeed, in some cases, we directly have, have thermal ablation, so using heat to, to treat. So not a great deal has changed, perhaps, in, in, that, in that sense. Um, so I'm going to think about the use of fire or of heat in, in medicine uh, over the next uh, few slides here. So that goes back a very long way. And I, I mentioned these two Egyptian papyri, Ebers and uh, Edwin Smith. Both of those talk about using heat or fire to, in, in treatment. In, in the first one, to treat um, an aneurysm and sort of abnormal vascular formation. Um, Thou shalt perform an operation for it. Heat with fire, it shall bleed much. Yes, I'm sure. And, and then Edwin Smith, this is a treatment for breast abscesses, what, he, what is called, uh, translated as breast uh, tumours, but very clearly here, and this is confused in some sources, this is talking about benign conditions, not, not about cancer, and it's, it's talking about using a fire drill. I've got a generic picture of an Egyptian fire drill down there. It works by, by friction to generate heat. Um, uh, but there's evidence in the, in the text that actually two different types of instruments, perhaps, are being uh, used in these two cases. So a very ancient use of a physical agent, in this case heat, to treat disease. Um, we come down to Hippocrates again. As I'd say, his name would crop up again. So Hi Hippocrates recommends uh, heat cauterization in a range of different treatments, including in his work De Hemorrhoidibus, uh, which is about, as the name suggests, the treatment of, of hemorrhoids. And, and he, he talks about that in rather graphical terms, which you can see illustrated very graphically on that slide. Um, but what, what, he's, what he's talking about is using, uh, he's talking about using seven or eight irons connected together, and then at the end, the last one is, is a flat like an obol. That's a type of small Greek coin. Uh, and that's what's being heated up then and used in the treatment. But in other conditions as well, sciatica, edema, Celsus a bit later, a Greek, um, no, a Roman scholar, though not a doctor, um, recommending a heat for treating a wide range of different conditions. So yeah, it's out there as a sort of general cure-all in a way, a physical agent used in, uh, in, in treatment. Well, you may well think, um, there's not great deal, okay, so heat is a physical agent, there's not a great deal of physics going on here, this is people just heating things up and using them to burn away bits of tissue or etc. So where's the actual physics behind this, other than that heat is a physical agent? That's where I would introduce this, this chap here, um, El Zarawi, who was working in Islamic uh, Spain in the 10th and into the 11th century. And he does seem very much to have applied material science, metallurgy, the physics of materials, to understanding what instruments to use in cauterization. He devised different tools for use in different parts of the body. Uh, he advised on what temperature to heat those uh, materials, the, the irons, up to, that they should be red hot so that that coagulates tissues rather than white hot, which just cuts through tissue, which is not what you want to do. And he advised that, we, that you shouldn't use uh, metals, other metals than iron that have a lower boiling, uh, melting point and are not suitable. So he's definitely applying physics to understanding the use of devices for this purpose. 
And this became a mainstay of surgery right through to medieval Europe. Um, to stem bleeding, which is you know, commonplace, sealing off blood vessels, but also to treat wounds and to destroy disease directly by burning out uh, diseased areas. There's a, an interesting example of this on the bottom right of the slide there. <coughs> that is the skull of St. Divinus of Armenia, which is preserved in a church in Lucca in Italy. Uh, and you can see a rather nasty skull injury towards the bottom of that slide there. And that slightly lighter colored area around that that is where a pentagonal shaped um, device has been used to cauterize the wound. Uh, the, there are x-rays in that, slide, in that um, paper as well, and you can see actually it's rather a nasty depressed skull injury from a, from a blunt instrument. Um, there's also a, uh, an, another injury on the skull which is, appears to be from a bladed instrument, so he appears to have had quite a uh, bad time of it, and he is a saint who is invoked against headaches, and so I think now we understand why, <laughs> why, why that might be. Um, so, so quite widespread use then of heat as a, as a physical agent in, in treatment. Um, uh, and, but I haven't talked about cancer specifically, and actually the treatment of cancer using uh, cauterization or indeed using surgery in general was generally discouraged uh, because there were fears of the disease, it, it causing the disease to spread uh, or to get worse, and you can see a quote from, from Celsus there uh, as an example of that. The exception being in very early stages of cancer where there was a chance of removing, destroying the disease completely, or where the tumour was superficial and could easily be, uh, be uh, uh, accessed. Uh, so for example, Leonides in the second or third century, we're not quite sure when, was using surgery and cauterization uh, to treat early stage breast cancer. So. Um, in, in the early stages of the procedure, that would be to control bleeding when you start to cut, but later on in the same procedure to actually destroy the disease um, itself. And that approach was still practiced at least through to <coughs> 14th century Europe. Um, I've put a quote from Galen here again, uh, who says that there's no small danger connected with this, using cauterization in cancer, um, when the cauterization takes place close to important organs. And as a medical physicist, I, I, I couldn't help, you may think this is a bit of a stretch again, but I couldn't help comparing that with the way that we plan radiotherapy treatments now, where treatment is planned so as to target the tumor that we want to, to, to treat and to, to destroy, but with very, very careful attention to minimizing the dose of radiation to adjacent organs at risk. And again, you can see a, a modern example there where the, the blue uh, outline in the sort of bottom right there, if you can see that, that's, that's the bladder and we want to treat the, that area, but um, there are other organs there that are outlined in other colors that we want to minimize the dose to. Um, so those concepts of applying, in that case, heat to treat an organ while minimizing damage to surrounding organs um, lives on in the way that we plan uh, radiotherapy treatments today. So my final example is using physics in, to explain the functioning of the body, and, and in this case particularly to explain vision, the, the physics of vision. So it turns out that there were different schools of thought in Greek antiquity about how vision works. It, it, does vision involve rays coming out from the eye, visual rays that, that sort of probe objects and, um, in that sense, or known as the extra mission theory, and you can see Euclid and Ptolemy uh, held to that, or there is the intromission view, which is that vision involves something coming into the eye and being perceived by, by the eye, and Epicurus and the other atomists tended to, to that. And then Aristotle and Galen appear to have some sort of uh, combination of those two approaches in their writings. Uh, and so this has not been resolved by the end of the classical period. And so you see ongoing discussion of this then in the, in the Islamic world where, where the classical writings had been preserved. And specifically in, in the work of Al-Hazan, who I have mentioned uh, before that, that's the Latinized version of the name of Hassan ibn al-Haytham, who lived in the 10th into the 11th century. Um, he was a fantastic polymath. He, he, he contributed across numerous different areas of philosophy, science, theology, etc. Um, uh, one of his uh, best-known books is the uh, Kitab al-Manazir, the Book of Optics, 
Uh, and in there, he comes down firmly in favour of intromission. In other words, vision involves something coming into the eye rather than rays coming out of the eye and probing things. And his arguments for that are, are quite interesting to, to set out, really. First of all, he notices that if we look at a bright light, when we look at the sun, for example, that can cause discomfort. And when we see a bright light and then look away, we have after images left in the eye. Well, that surely suggests something's coming into the eye from the bright light and not the other way around. And then, well, when we switch the lights off, we, we don't see at all. So if, if, well, what, what's, how has that changed the eye? Why, why should that be the case if extra mission were the mechanism? And then if we then, in a dark room, make a hole in the wall and light comes through, well, that light only illuminates the area uh, in the vicinity of the hole. So again, why would that be in an extra mission model? Um, and then I think quite uh, uh, tellingly as well, uh, obviously, we, when we look at things, clearly there is information coming to us from the object. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to tell anything about the object. So uh, that, again, suggests that, that rays going out are at least uh, redundant. Um, and finally, uh, when we look up at the sky, we see the whole sky all at once. We see the stars in the sky. Are we really supposed to believe that visual rays are coming out of our eyes and suddenly filling the whole of the heavens all at once, but actually the eyes are not being diminished in any way? There's no obvious loss of any substance from the eyes. So for all of those reasons, he believed in uh, intromission, and he was, he was right, of, of course, and he, he believed that, that light and, and with it colour come to us from objects that we see in our visual field, um, and that light is either emitted by the object or it's reflected light from another object. And it travels through a transparent medium and comes into the eye. So that's a good description of how, uh, how vision works, I would say. Further, he looked at that in terms of the anatomy of the visual system, and, and here he was basing himself mainly on... On, on Galen's work again, so um, uh, again, uh, perhaps imperfect understanding that wasn't based on human dissection, but this is Alhazen's diagram of, of the eyes, and you can see how he's got the two optic nerves that then connect together and go into the, into the, in a common nerve then into the brain. Uh, so that's an interesting dimension to this. Um, Alhazen believed that, again with Galen, that the visual sensation itself occurred at the front surface of the glacial humour, which is now what we would now call the lens of the eye, and that light's then refracted when he reaches the interface between the, that glacial humour, the lens, and the vitreous humour that sits in the chamber of the eye behind the lens, and then it travels um, through, through that uh, vitreous humour and down through the optic nerve, which he thought was a, was a, a hollow uh, tube, uh, into the brain, into the vertus distinctiva, which is the place in the brain where the, where the cognitive powers sit. So that's where we perceive, you know, light and colour are, are travelling from the object, but the, the more, uh, the, the other sort of properties of the object, its position, its shape, the subjective things like its beauty, etc., they're perceived in the brain. So not, not only had he sort of looked at the, the, uh, the, 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 how vision works from a physics point of view and, and the uh, the physics of the of the optic of the visual system, but he had recognised that the brain plays a part in perception. He was the first person to to, to do that. Um, but he had a bit of a problem, which is that if we're saying that rays from every point, so an infinite set of points on the surface of an object, reach uh, every point on the surface of the lens equally, then how do we actually form an image of the object? Surely that's just a recipe for confusion. Uh, every point on the surface of the lens receives light rays from every part of the object. Well, how's that an image? And so he decided then that, well, it's only those light rays that reach, um, that, that arrive perpendicularly normally to the surface of the lens that contribute to the image, and the others are refracted away. Those that arrive at an angle are refracted away. His writing is a little bit confused in places, and sometimes it looks as if he's saying those rays do contribute, but to, to a lesser extent. But primarily, it's the ray that arrives normal to the surface of the lens. You can see those rays, the two examples I've given there in that diagram, are, are converging. Uh, they, so they would form a, a cone that converges somewhere in the eye. Well, not so, because then they're refracted again as they pass from the lens into the vitreous humour. Uh, and they pass to the optic nerve. And so what we're getting there is a one-to-one -one representation of the surface of the image that we're looking at, uh, an upright image. 
that then passes through the eye, down the optic nerve, and into the brain. So quite interesting, although Al Hazen, among his other uh, achievements, he invented the pinhole camera, or the, or the camera obscura, but he uh, didn't think that's how the eye worked. He, he, he wasn't keen on the idea that the eye formed an inverted image. He kept this upright image all the way through. Right, and as I said, he, he was a, um, a, a polymath. He's often regarded as the, uh, the first true scientist, and it sees that term being used. And his work then was translated into Latin in the 12th century and picked up by people like uh, Robert Gross Test and Roger Bacon, who took it further, working here just down the road in Oxford in the 13th century. So, so we come full circle back to here. Um, so so I've, I've reached the end, really, of what I wanted to say. And what, what I've, I hope I've, uh, I've tried to persuade you of, and you, you would be the judges of this, is that actually medical applications of physics go a long way back before Röntgen and, and even before the scientific revolution, in fact, by, by several millennia. Uh, and that at the heart of Greek physics, physicae, were theories about the nature and composition of the universe, which are very much part of physics as we understand it today, and which underpinned medicine as it developed in that culture as well. So that that, that, that approach to medicine, humoral medicine, Galenic medicine, which, which dominated right down into the 16th century, was based on that early understanding of physics. So that, that's my first uh, thesis, I guess. And then my other one is that, well, we, if we look at ancient medical practice, we find examples of physics being applied to medicine in, a, in similar ways to the way it's applied now in, in diagnosis. The example I showed you from Hippocrates, potentially the first medical imaging technique 2,000 years before Röntgen. Um, the use of physical agents like fire and, and heat in therapy, going back at least three and a half millennia with consideration of side effects, as we would today with radiation. Um, but also physics being used to explain body functions, specifically uh, vision, over a thousand years ago. So, so thank you very much for, for your attention uh, this morning. As I say, it's been a pleasure to put this together. I don't claim to be an expert on this, but I'm happy to take comments and questions very much. Thank you, thank you very, very much. We have 15 minutes for questions, so first we start. Uh, thank you for that, that was very interesting. Well, that um, medical imaging that you showed with the clay, the, the publication of it, what, what was the pathology that the, the person had? In, in the publication, yeah. uh, the modern publication, yes. so that they had no pathology, they, they'd simulated the heating that would have been caused by a plural effusion, oh, okay. but by putting some um, extract from hot peppers on the oh, surface. Oh, sorry, of the yeah, skin. yeah, I missed that. Okay. So, yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah and, and that's why. So, in fact, that, that the, the pepper extract then actually wasn't a particularly good mimic in other respects yeah. for the plural effusion because it caused changes in microcirculation. That that's that's one, one of their sort of uh, confounders. Just because normally the plural effusion would be at the bottom, so it was quite unusual to be yeah. in the middle. So yeah, well, I was that may be because there was. Yeah, I don't suppose they were too careful about exactly where they put it. Yeah. The point was the mechanism rather than the, yeah, mimicking the pathology as such. Okay, thanks. Thank you. No, fantastic lecture. Thank you so much. I, I, I listened to it with great interest, and I was thinking, this is mostly concentrating toward Europe and the Middle East. And obviously being an Indian, I'm thinking there was a lot yeah. of surgery yeah. being invented in India as well. And it would yes. be very interesting to compare and contrast the surgical procedures that were invented yes. and discovered, uh, and, and maybe even see, were they at the same time or later, or was there any effect either, either way? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, that's a very, very well-made point, and, and I am conscious that there is, that I've focused on specific cultures here, and that antiquity in the Middle Ages is, is, is clearly not just restricted to Europe, even if we include the broader Islamic civilization in that as well. Um, my, my only excuse is, is one of, 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 of time, and, you know, both in terms of the research and, and the length of the presentation. But, but yes, so and some of those ideas, like for example, the, the idea of humoral medicine has parallels, and here's where I get really onto my thin territory for me, but in, in India and, and also in China. Um, which I've read about, but it's, you know, it's just the limitations. Whether one could say in the same way that that was based on a, 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 an understanding of, of physics, and I put that in, in quotes, in those cultures as well, in the way that it was in Greece and the legacy of that, that I don't know. 
And that would be something that would be certainly interesting to explore. Thank you. It does sound like a PhD, which I didn't have time to do a PhD for this. But it felt like it at times. <laughs> yes. Hi. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, a great, great talk. Thank you. Um, it was fun to watch how uh, Hippocrates doing his thermal imaging. Dare one ask, how did he find out that for patients with that particular set of symptoms, you needed to find a warm bit and jab them, and that would yeah. make them better? Yeah, that, that's a good question, I, I, to which I don't know the answer, other than to say that, that Hippoc my understanding is Hippocrates was a very hands-on physician. So I can only assume, and it is an assumption by me, that that, that was based on his clinical experience. Um, and, and, you know, as with a lot of things, you can only surmise that there must have been a lot of incisions made in the wrong place <laughs> and a lot of an, ensuing unpleasantness for the patients while people found out actually the, the right... But that, that's, I think, true of the history of medicine in general. The, yeah. Somewhere at the front well, here. The, the, there is oh, the first there, uh, yeah, okay. back, and then oh, we come. I didn't see that one. Thank you. That was an amazing um, whistle-stop tour. <laughs> I'm just thinking about the um, risk of infection in surgery back in those times. Do you have any comment about people's understanding about that? Thanks. Um, simple answer, not really. That, that takes me a long way outside my expertise. Other than to say, again, my assumption would be that understanding of infection would have been very poor. Um, so obviously the, the way in which infection works was not understood until well into the modern period. Uh, microorganisms, etc. But, it, you know, based on what I've just said about Hippocrates and presumably lots of other contemporaries as well, being very good hands-on physicians and uh, learning from clinical experience, presumably they would have encountered those things and, and would have some idea about, um, if not necessarily the, the cause in terms of a mechanism, but at least the ways of, of pre pre preventing it, um, if only through hard-learned empirical evidence in the, in the way that I've just described. Lots, lots of patients perhaps coming to a sticky end as part of their learning process. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Just here. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, as they could, couldn't or wouldn't dissect human beings, did they not dissect animals? They, they did dissect animals, yes. And when yes. did the retina when was that discovered? The, re the retina, I think, is... Um, I think is... I have the name Kepler in my head for some reason, but, but that's not an area where I would have, would have thought. But, um, so I think... So Al Hazen, in his writings, talks... Of, he, he knew that the retina existed. Um, so, yes, from the animal dissections that were available, that, that would have been discovered... But I don't think, well, there, there certainly wasn't any understanding of its, of its function. I think that required a, you know, a type of science that just wasn't available at the time. But, but yes, they, the, the anatomical work that had been done on animals did, they had discovered the retina. We have a question up there. Up Could you please just loud? <laughs> it's hard for us to get the microphone there. How did proponents? Yeah, um, I, I don't know. It's, it's a simple answer to that. I, I mean, I, so I, I, this, this may seem uh, unlikely, but the, so Al Hazel advanced those arguments that, 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 that those were arguments against the extra mission theory. Um, it is possible, again, a little degree of speculation on my part, that that was the first time that anyone had, uh, had, had advanced those arguments. Uh, although there was at least one earlier, again, in the Islamic world, uh, author whose name I can't remember, who had worked on vision as well. So it may be slightly earlier. But I think this was, these were the times when these, these arguments were being advanced and recognised for the first time. So it, it may be that, that just no one had thought of that before. Thank you. One more question. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, we, uh, we will pass the microphone. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Aristotle talked about um, the five humours, not, not just the, the, the four. Yeah. Um, subsequent people ran with the four. The quinescence, uh, was that uh, 
sort of the spirit, the uh, the soul, the something that oh. differentiated between um, uh, a, a living thing and a dead thing. Uh, so again, um, my understanding this is imperfect, but but I would say probably not because I, I I think what he was saying was that the everything in the terrestrial realm, so everything on on Earth, is made of the four elements, and that fifth element, ether, quintessence, is what the the celestial world is made of so the place where the planets and the stars exist i don't think he was saying that that element is present in us and is a, and is a, a spirit or a soul if, if that's what you are so that's again I, I, i'm not an expert but that's my understanding yes I, it's probably in the realm of biochemistry but w when were drugs invented was, yeah. was that an awful long time ago or was that relatively recently I'm sure there'll be people in this room who know a lot more about that than I do. Um, I, I, I suspect that we humans were using um, drugs, even if they were derived from, from plants, for example, for a very long time. Uh, when that turned into something a bit more like what we might think of as pharmaceuticals now is well outside my territory. Uh, but the idea of using plants, witch hazel, yes, or you know, other plants as in medical treatment to alleviate pain or whatever. It must be very, very ancient. Chemical manufacturing of drugs as we know them today is really part of the second half of the 19th century in Germany. Yeah, okay. So that, that's part of the answer, really. So, you know, formal pharmaceutical manufacturing, not until very, very recently, 19th century. <laughs> you basically introduced the application of physics uh, into medicine, modern time, and you sought uh, similar practices in the past. Yes. But there's one major difference between the past and now, and that is, in the past, the ideas, the resolution of the ideas were much coarse, and therefore uh, uh, they were haphazardly and uh, subject to a lot of errors. But now, uh, the resolution is getting finer and finer and the ideas are never fixed and they are continually being uh, 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 improved. Uh, so, the way you are looking at uh, into the past has got the risk that we are really looking at the past by modern lenses. Yes. rather than yeah. exploring how their worldview were. Don't yeah. you think that's a bit also risky or haphazardly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I completely take your point. We're, we're applying, and I think I said that when I introduced that, that approach, that we're, we're applying a sort of modern categorization in a context in which it is seriously anachronistic. Yes, 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 <laughs> you're right. But that, that's the lens through which I've looked at this as, as a modern medical physicist. Uh, of, of course, people at that time didn't see things in, in quite those same terms. I, I, I take your point entirely. Thank you. And one more question. Yes, one, and then we stop. With, uh, um, was Gawain, was he the physician, or whatever the right word is, that treated gladiators? For injuries, because if that was the case, he would have had quite a good insight into I, injuries of the body and how bits worked and so on. So I, I, I wondered about that, funny enough. I, I don't know for sure, but, but I wondered because, hmm. of course, the, the, you know, if you think of, and this is probably not a, a good sort of scholarly reference, but if you think <laughs> of the film Gladiator, where we have, <laughs> you know, a lot, some of those emperors who, to whom he was the personal physician were involved in that, were depicted in that film, Commodus in particular, who allegedly fought as a gladiator in the, in the arena, and he was Commodus's personal physician. So, you know, you, you could almost picture him in that film, couldn't you, <laughs> sort of treating him after... So, so it's, I think it's in, that, that, that speculation aside, I think it's entirely probable, really, that, that he would have, if, if not gladiators in the arena, then you know, maybe soldiers who'd been injured in battle, so, yes. Are you sure? You think you would have got the hint? Geometry is correct. Yes, yes that's, 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 that's a very good point. Yes, yes. Thank you. And we will take a last question there. Yeah. 
Thank you. It's um, not a new idea to me, but it's still fascinating that all these uh, Greek discoveries and developments kind of went underground, not exactly underground, but as far as the West was concerned, underground. Um, why did it disappear into the Islamic world? Yeah. What exactly was behind that? Um, and when it reappeared in the West, was there uh, resistance because it had come through the Islamic world? Ah, well, th those are very good questions, which, again, are probably slightly beyond my brief. You, you, you need really a, a, not just a historian of science, but a sort of broader cultural historical view, I, I suspect. I mean, there is this concept of the Dark Ages in, in Western Europe, which, which you know, then, <coughs> I'm not sure, but then one hears, is, is, you know, other, other, other historians will, will contest that, that, that perhaps the Dark Ages are not quite so, so dark. But, but certainly it does appear that um, <coughs> those classical writings were better preserved in Islamic culture and, and then came back. Whether, so that's a very interesting question. Was there, at the end of, of what you were saying, was there resistance to that because it was coming out of the Islamic world? Uh, that would be, again, an interesting topic to, to research. Um, I, I, I certainly, I, in the limited amount of reading I've done, I, I haven't seen any evidence of resistance on, on the part of the scholars who were you know, translating that into, into Latin and, and using it. Whether there was any, any sort of broader resistance would be an interesting research. Another PhD. <laughs> Thank you very much for the wonderful president and for the answer to our question. Thank you.